Welcome to Providence's very first Health Equity in Action podcast. I'm your host, Angela Mara. I'm a caregiver at Providence, and I want to talk to you about why we're here today. At Providence, we believe that action must follow promising words. We understand that equity in healthcare is not what it should be. Longstanding injustices have created disparities for many populations in accessing, receiving, and experiencing quality care. It's time to shine a spotlight on these inequities, get a little uncomfortable, and address them head on. I'm blessed to be a part of an organization that shares these values, which is why Providence made a decision in 2020 to invest $50 million toward health equity. We take the responsibility of understanding health inequities as sacred and critical work. We're using the money invested to double down on achieving health equity. We work alongside communities to drive and execute change, and that change is making a real difference in patient lives. However, U.S. healthcare still has a great distance to travel to achieve health equity. We'd like to invite you into our journey by sharing with you some of our key conversations with community partners, patients, and caregivers. We're going to hear stories of healthcare gone wrong, as well as what it takes to make it right. This first set of episodes is all about a very important role in shaping that change, the community health worker or CHW. To help us with this conversation, I'd like you all to meet Hannah Lobinger, a fellow caregiver at Providence who has been invested in supporting the growth of the CHW workforce for the last 10 years. Welcome, Hannah. Hi, Angela. Thank you so much for having me today. So Hannah, you came to me over a year ago because you wanted to get the word out about this role. And you mentioned particularly its synergy with our work on health equity. Can you share a bit about how does your role relate to the community health worker? I started in this role nearly two years ago, and this was a new role for Providence where my focus is specifically to support community health and traditional health worker roles across Providence's seven state footprint. I don't directly oversee community health worker programs, but rather act as a convener, advocate, developer, and part of my work is to socialize this workforce. Wait, so we've been talking about community health workers, but I feel like we need to back up a little bit. What is a CHW or a community health worker? Community health workers are trusted community members that work within their particular community to build relationships and help individuals access services equitably. This role is known by a variety of different names. So you might hear us talking about a community health worker, a promotora, a cultural navigator, and a health advocate. And this is really representative of the variety and uniqueness of the type of work that community health workers do. Why did you feel so strongly that we needed to focus on the CHW in this type of venue? Community health workers are newer to working within health system. The integrated model of a community health worker program is something that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks. And this is newer for health systems. What a CHW is, is a question that I often get. And so there's an opportunity for us to share the amazing work that they do and the impact that they have in newer forums. Community health workers are a key facet of Providence's health equity strategy. And so to be able to leverage the voices of the community health workers to tell their story so that people better understand the work they do, that only puts us further along in our health equity journey. Okay, so you and I started brainstorming ways to really get the word out about what CHWs do. And you started having conversations with CHWs, with um, clients of the CH, of CHWs, with other caregivers. How did it go? Angela, it was such a remarkable journey and and privilege to have the opportunity to sit with our amazing community health workers as they vulnerably shared their own stories and what that means to the work they do. As we listen to some of these conversations, what should our audiences know to prepare? One of the key components of the community health worker work and the stories that you're going to be hearing is trust. We talk about trust over and over again. And so I want folks to really be listening for that as a theme to this workforce. 
So over the next several weeks, you're going to be hearing from community health workers, program leaders, and the neighbors that they serve. And we will be discussing the role of a community health worker, as well as the impact on the communities and the systems they serve. So you've mentioned neighbor a few times. What do you, what do you really mean by that? We're really intentional about the way that we describe the relationship between a community health worker and the community or individual that they're serving. Oftentimes, CHWs are serving the community in which they're from. They're serving the people who live next door to them. They're serving Mm. uh, the clients that they have within the the supermarket or their local food bank. And so with that intentionality, we call their clients neighbors. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm just so excited to share these conversations with our audience. Okay, let's start with one conversation you had with a fellow caregiver who's been working with CHWs for many years, Dr. Katarina Kine. Oh, yes, Dr. Kine. Dr. Kine's a remarkable caregiver who has spent much of her career working within the community health space. Dr. Kine held a role leading a CHW program in Northern California called Paso a Paso. Angela, here's part of my conversation with her as she's discussing the many ways CHWs support their neighbors. Katerina, can you tell me a little bit about what you think health systems have done in the past to address, as you mentioned, social drivers and why utilizing a CHW workforce integrated within a clinical system like you're talking about is so much different and so much more effective than strategies health systems have taken in the past. Sometimes community health workers are helping patients uh, with transportation so that they can access health Uh, appointments and reduce their no-show. Community health workers are helping with improving compliance or helping providers improve their quality of care metrics. Um, They might be able to address some of the reasons why they're not non-compliant with the provider so that we can help refer them to better care access. So they are able to really be a liaison between multiple different points of care and connect the dots for patients so that they can have a seamless care experience. One of the key aspects that we've heard along this journey and and, um, continue to hear in conversation with our community health worker workforce is the, the importance of the trust that is built between a CHW and their neighbor to be able to work with them in a way that um, collectively we are able to reduce the inequities that exist within our community. Um, And I'm curious if you can talk about whether it be with your experience with Paso a Paso or in other um, work experiences or personal experiences you've had, how that trusting relationship creates a different uh, relationship between a, a CHW, their neighbor, and the health system. So, you know, improving that patient provider relationship is is critical. And, you know, I will speak as, you know, a woman of color of Afro and European diasporic descent and ma- maternal health outcomes are an area where community health workers, also known as doulas, um, provide an enormous service for helping um, reduce infant mortality and maternal mortality um, for Black and African-American patients who are birthing people. Um, When we think about uh, how patients uh, and providers often are at odds with each other, um, a community health worker can really help clarify and help with cultural responsivity and cultural accountability for providers who may not understand or maybe unlearning problematic systems, Uh, for instance, Many medical providers have maybe never seen a brown person in their medical book, in their anatomical books. Um, They might believe, uh, you know, falsehoods about uh, pain thresholds for people of color. They might not, uh, they might believe that people of color are drug seeking when they're talking about pain. And, you know, as we integrate community health workers into our mainstream healthcare systems, Hopefully, we're allowing a knowledge exchange to happen, um, not at the burden uh, or the expense of the community health worker, but um, to, you know, 
in a way that helps enhance and leverage the knowledge that community health workers bring to the table so that they can reflect that knowledge in brave spaces that allow for providers to think a little bit differently about their standard ways of delivering care. And while we're moving at that speed of trust, we're also moving at the speed of change. And right now, community health workers offer us a way to see and deliver health care in a way that responds to our patients' needs directly instead of indirectly and where we can account for that. Another area that community health workers uh, really can offer support in is uh, parallel care, care modalities. Many of our Southern Indigenous populations or tribal populations um, may use traditional health care models and often are afraid to tell providers that because they're afraid of judgment. And so there may be two, you know, providers happening, a traditional provider and a Western medicine provider. Sometimes a community health worker can help empower that patient to talk to the provider, can help the provider do some research about those parallel or traditional healthcare models so that they can earn trust with the patient because that's what we want to do. I'm really struck by your phrase of moving at the speed of trust and moving at the speed of change. I think that's a really interesting way of phrasing the time that we are in in healthcare right now. We see uh, the, the demand for a community health worker like role growing exponentially across our country because of the recognition that health systems broadly need, need to be doing something different to provide more responsive care to communities who are seeking care in our hospital systems. And you spoke a bit about biases that exist within our health systems and how community health workers can also, along with the trusted building, the trusted relationship building with a neighbor or a patient or a community member, they're also playing a role in advocacy with the, system, the health system to uh, support and educate and advocate for the humanity and the uniqueness and the power of that individual. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Can you just dive into more of the advocacy component of the CHW role, especially within health systems? Sure. And, you know, looking back at the nearly 20 years of the PASO Apaso program, it was founded um, by the sisters um, to address the severe inequities here in Northern California, where we had lots of patients of mixed status um, coming across the border and community members without food, delivering babies, you know, without adequate medical care, no language translation at any services. And, you know, ultimately just living in isolation. And part of the work that they've done over the past 20 years is break down those barriers through advocacy by saying, hey, we need Spanish language on these intake forms. We, you know, they may not know that there's regulatory compliance issues or violation issues, but intuitively they know that their justice and integrity values, um, along with compassion and dignity and excellence, um, really means that patients need to be advocates advocated for so that they can get a fair and excellent experience when they come visit us. Now, 20 years later, almost every health organization in our community has dedicated Span Spanish language speakers, has everything in multi-languages, iPads for non-English speaking patients and language lines and there's it's such a difference and we've seen you know the impact of that work of community health workers advocating tirelessly for you know to tear down barriers and build a successful relationships with our provider partners when we think about health equity and when we use the term health equity we understand that that is the fair and just access to opportunities for all to achieve the highest level of health. And we also know right now across our country and across Providence seven state footprint that do, we do not have fair and just access for all communities to have the right of health. CHWs and CHW like roles can be a strategy to support systems while 
being building trust with neighbors, as you've talked about, as well as advocating for the system. And in doing that, they're working to break down the barriers that exist within our inherently racist systems. What work do you feel needs to be done to continue to break down these barriers, both within Providence and nationally? Well, you know, professionally, we want to make sure that we're not racializing community health workers. And and what that means is we want to make sure that we are growing community health workers into our next leaders, and we're not just keeping them at the front line. And so we want to make sure that we give our community health workers opportunities for advancement. And so sometimes I, I feel in conflict with not over professionalizing the role. Of course, we want people from all backgrounds to be able to ex access this work, but also making sure that community health workers are given the tools so that they can change alongside our health systems and feel competent with our organizational cultures as they're managing, um, you know, different cultures outside of the walls. And I just wanted to mention that because it, it's important as we think about health equity from the patient to caregiver spectrum and our, our thinking really about how we're improving that equity along the line as many of our community health workers are also patients. So because they have lived experience, they often experience the inequities or the disparate conditions that our patients uh, experience, um, assumptions that maybe they don't have a certain education or that they are bilingual, um, you know, that, that, that they, you know, aren't experts on their own lived experience. And, you know, what is, what patients end up experiencing tr traditionally is knowledge gaps um, from providers who are just like, I just don't know. I don't know how to respond. I don't know what to do. I've never heard of this. And I'm just going to use my, you know, traditional Western knowledge to assess this situation. And by helping our providers learn from our patient populations in ways that um, equalize the patient provider relationship as we move away from that paternalistic model where the provider is the expert and the patient has to quietly listen and level set that relationship to a collaborative model um, where the patient and provider is in you know are working equally together um, we really have to continue to advocate so that providers don't don't simply dismiss um, patients uh, who uh, are doing their best to participate in a system that is foreign to them. One example is a patient told us that the only thing that they knew in the only really phrase other than money and bathroom and water in English was, do you understand? And as they went through detention, you know, everyone kept shouting, do you understand? And the thing that you answered was yes. So when they're in that per patient provider, you know, they're in that exam room and the provider says, do you understand? The patient says yes, because that is what they were taught to do. That didn't mean that the patient understood anything about the provider's directions or diagnoses or follow-up care, but they knew that they should answer yes to the phrase, do you understand? Because that would keep them alive. Um, another thing that, um, you know, our community health worker populations have taught us is that for uh, populations that are in high, uh, come from very high gang activity, you know, they're refugee populations and they, flee, uh, they fled uh, intense gang activity, um, that timeliness and predictability are, are dangerous. And so um, they've part of the resiliency model that many of our neighbors and patients have developed is actually an, an unpredictable model. So that way they're not targeted. So if they're late for their appointment or they don't necessarily follow up on their care predictably, that's a cultural thing that we need to understand and respond to better, as opposed to just saying this patient is non-compliant and I'm discharging them from my office. So as we work with our community health workers, we can see into things that we don't really understand understand at all and have a better understanding of how to serve our patients with our mission and values intact. 
Thank you so much for sharing those stories. If you could sum up in one or two words what this workforce means to you, what would that be? I would say this is a workforce that develops partnerships, and those partnerships are with our patients, and they're with our providers, and they're with our community-based organizations. And so this is a position, you know, or these are positions that collaborate across enormous networks in order to help understand the complexities around healthcare. So when we think of how we better partner with our patient populations, this is it. And, you know, the next step is to recognize that these are patient facing positions and these positions generate indirect ROI and that they're not in competition with care managers and social workers, but that they're part of the team that need to be included as, as part of a legitimate care team as we're moving to that next step of healthcare. So uh, they're partners, they're collaborators, and they're fragmentation fighters. You know, you started the episode by talking about the siloed nature of healthcare, and um, I, I just really appreciate you kind of bringing that back to talking about the reduction of fragmentation and how CHWs are an integral piece to us connecting and wrapping around communities and holistically seeing patients for who they are and valuing their culture and skills and strengths. Less coming from a, a deficit-based model and more transitioning to a strengths-based model in the way, a st responsive strengths-based model in the way that we provide care. And CHWs can help us see these things and CHWs can help advocate for change and help connect the various different components of, of siloed care, which includes those social drivers of health, as you're talking about, those social needs of individuals. Health care and health is so deeply connected with all of these other inequities that exist. Health and social services and financial insecurity are all deeply um, embedded and ingrained to someone's um, ability to uh, achieve health. Thank you so much, Katerina. Um, it has been just an absolute pleasure to chat with you today. Well, I appreciate your time today, Hannah, and thanks for having me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your perspective and sharing your knowledge with us. I just learned so much and I'm so inspired. Katarina really explained so many ways that CHWs can bridge the gap for our patients, whether that's cultural, um, language, or really the pinnacle of it all by building trust. Unfortunately, our systems as they're built, as Katarina mentioned, are really siloed. And this role helps to connect various different components of the health system. So as Katerina mentioned, whether that's a community-based organization where someone is receiving housing support, that CHW will connect that back to the medical component of the health system. And it's really important for someone's primary care provider to know that they might be at risk of losing housing. In our traditional systems, that might not be something that the primary care provider knows. But as we have learned, social determinants of health or social drivers of health are incredibly important to someone achieving their, their health goals. And so this CHW role in the way that Katarina described it really helps to close the siloing or to be those fragmentation fighters or to bridge that gap between that very fragmented system. In the next episode of Health Equity in Action, you have a conversation with Mohammed Akmush that I find so inspiring. Can you share with us just a few sentences about that? Mohammed is a cultural navigator at Swedish in Washington, and he and I sit down and have a remarkable chat about his role and the focus of his work aiming to ensure that his community has equitable access to preventive services. We have this really interesting conversation, Angela, about the difference between availability and accessibility. So I'm really excited to dive in 
to this concept with everyone coming up next. Thank you for listening. Let us all stand together, recognizing action must follow promising words.